I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. We're going to be talking about the ride-sharing companies on the show today. These are companies who have been popping up around America to compete with the large taxi monopolies that were previously the only organizations that could transport you via an automobile from one place to another, especially within a large city. So the traditional model of uh, taxis has been that the taxi company would go to the government and get a license or a medallion, which uh, traditionally cost tons of money. I think in New York City, it was a a million dollars for one of these medallions. And so what happened is that recently, uh, Uber and Lyft and all of these ride-sharing companies started popping up and allowed people to share their cars, uh, especially when they were going in the same direction as some of the passengers who wanted to go to a similar place. So let's say you get in your car and you were driving to, I don't know, Hartford, and then you'd look on uh, Uber as long as you are a... um, a certified driver for Uber, and they would connect you with anybody who wanted to also go to Hartford, and uh, you would pick them up and drop them off, and you would get a fee for transporting that person from one place to another. Now, the problem is that the taxis, again, have this monopoly because of the medallions and because of their lobbying of the government and protectionist type of organization. And so they are threatened by this new competition that is coming into the market and providing services that are very similar to what the taxis have traditionally supplied. Now, this type of protectionism where the government is either um, protecting the taxi industry or the taxi industry is lobbying the government for help against competition and using laws to prevent competition from coming about, uh, this is a very common thing in the mercantilist or corporatist type of society. This has been going on in America since the late 1800s with the railroad companies and the manufacturing organizations who lobbied for very high tariffs and lobbied for uh, subsidies and all sorts of government grants and things like this to prop up their business at the expense of other competitors who don't have that advantage. So what happens is the government provides a legal advantage to some people, which discounts other people from providing that same service. So the doctors in the early 1900s uh, went to the government and got licenses enforced because there were too many doctors, as they claimed. And, uh, you know, the doctors would go and make house visits. There were so many of them. The prices were very cheap. So it was very hard to make a living as a doctor because there were so many people providing that service and they were they were providing very high quality versions of that service. And so the protectionists, the people who want to make more money at the expense of their competition, go to the government and get some sort of grant or special privilege, in this case licensure, to uh, get everybody else out of the market. And this uh, battle between taxis and ride-sharing companies is just another iteration of this same ongoing kind of process. So uh, the first article I want to read is by Jeffrey Tucker, and he is going to talk about why be nice to your cab driver and why should he actually be nice to you. And he's going to talk a little bit about the market incentives that uh, ride sharing companies have versus the traditional taxi kind of model. Ever since Lawrence Reed started writing about the relationship between liberty and personal character, I've been seeing examples all around me. Reed writes, quote, You can't choose your height or race or many other physical traits, but you fine-tune your character every time you decide right from wrong and what you personally are going to do about it. Your character is further defined by how you choose to interact with others and the standards of speech and conduct you practice. A good case concerns automotive transportation in cities. After years of coming to expect rudeness and disregard from cab drivers, the rise of peer-to-peer ride-sharing has changed my expectations. With it, I'm often impressed at how kind and helpful the drivers are to passengers like me. They want to serve my needs. They give me a bottle of water, help me around the city, provide pleasant conversations, keep their car clean, and so on. 
To put it simply, they are more decent to me and other passengers. It's such a wonderful surprise and relief. Who knew that hailing a taxi could be such a wonderful experience of human contact and cooperation? Who knew what we were missing all along? It's beautiful to see how a drop of liberty can so dramatically improve life. It's not because ride-sharing drivers are more morally upstanding than regular cabbies. It is because they are accountable for the service they provide. It is market competition that makes it work. They know that bad service will cause me, the customer, to give them a lower rating. What they want is repeat business, and the best way to gain that is by being an exceptional service provider. In other words, they want me to like them. As Reed says, competition is striving for excellence in the service of others. But here's where it gets interesting. Not many people know that the customers are rated as well. Every time I take one of these ride-sharing cars, the driver is asked whether I was a good passenger. I'm rated one to five stars. If my rating sinks, it is very possible that I will lose access to rides. It's all up to the driver. He or she can accept or reject my request. This incentivizes me to be on my best behavior, to be the best customer I can be. Compare this system to traditional cab services. There is something of a tradition of young people being wicked into cabbies. Out late, drinking too much, it's common for people to get into the cab and harass and tease the driver, not necessarily cruelly, but with obvious disregard for normal manners and decency. I'm guessing that the reader has seen or experienced this, so there is no reason to elaborate. The reason for this bad behavior? Cabbies are required by law to pick people up. They have no choice. Consumers do not have a choice to ride anything but municipal services. They have no choice. Neither the cabbie nor the consumer has an investment in making the ride a good experience. Because the accountability is drained from the relationship, it becomes a pure exchange of cash without the necessary personal human component. Is it any wonder that too many cab rides are an exercise in mutual rudeness? They put poor personal character on display. This cannot happen with Uber without some consequence. If you speak abusively to the driver of an Uber, he will record it, and this will be taken into consideration the next time you push the button on your app to call a car. You will probably start having longer waits. If you do this consistently, you will not be picked up at all. It's called responsibility or being answerable for your actions. Recently, I needed to call a ride share for myself and a group of other people. When the driver arrived, lots of people who had been drinking too much piled in, without knowledge that this was not a normal cab service. I watched from the back seat as they engaged in the antics people often pull in the cars of municipal services. Of course, I was mortified, and I quickly explained to them the stakes, that I would be held accountable for their actions, and that how they behaved would reflect on my own standing as a passenger. They were stunned to hear this, and apologized profusely, and quickly volunteered to add to the tip. For my own part, I make special efforts to smooth things over with the driver in order to maintain my rating. I left that experience with a profound realization. Even the smallest changes in institutional conditions can fundamentally alter our behavior and the personal character that behavior puts on display. The difference between a municipal service without stakeholders and competition as versus a private service in a competitive market can turn bad behavior into good, even turn what seems like an intractable jungle into a charming tea party of mutual respect. Does this matter? It absolutely does. Private enterprise in a competitive market humanizes our relationships and makes us accountable for how we treat others. When you compromise these institutions even slightly, adding that element of force that comes with monopolization or other forms of government control, you take a step away from making economic relationships genuine human relationships. It coarsens the culture, depreciates evolved norms of social engagement, and disincentivizes us all to treat each other as valuable. 
The reductio of this principle can be seen in line at airport security, at the post office, or the driver's license bureau, or even dealing with revenue agents or police. The further we move from free market-based relationships toward relationships created by force and coercion, the less civilized the world becomes and the less personal character is on display. The less we treat each other with dignity. A society of unencumbered laissez-faire is also one of unending personal accountability. It means, at the very least, that we are rewarded for good character and discouraged from abusing the courtesies of others. Free markets mean doing to others what we would have them do to us. That article is by Jeffrey A. Tucker, and it was called Why Be Nice to Your Cab Driver? And it was posted on the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org. So also posted on the Foundation for Economic Education is an article about how the French are responding uh, in terms of their taxi drivers to these new ride-sharing organizations. So government organizations uh, and licensure and uh, laws and things like that which protect certain industries as opposed to others are necessarily a violent exercise. So if a, a ride-sharing company wants to compete with a taxi company and is forbidden to do so by law, if they try to provide that product and just go around the law and just do it anyway, then they're going to have the police come and arrest them and drag them off and uh, they will no longer be able to provide that product by the government decrees that are put in place. And uh, we see this being actually acted out in France um, by the cab drivers um, who are attacking Uber uh, with actual physical violence. So again, the laws actually imply physical violence. Here we see French taxi drivers actually carrying out the violence. So again, this article was posted on the Foundation for Economic Education, and they say, Yesterday, French taxi drivers declared war on Uber. The Verge reported, quote, French taxi drivers today blocked roads to airports and train stations in Paris as part of a nationwide protest against Uber. Thousands of drivers are expected to participate in today's strike in the French capital and other major cities, where tensions between taxi unions and private car services are running high. Protesters burned tires and turned over cars along major thoroughfares, and there have been reported scuffles between taxi drivers and other chauffeurs. Police and riot gear intervened at one point with tear gas. There have been reports today of taxi drivers seeking out and harassing Uber employees near Paris's major airports and along major highways, with the blockade forcing some to walk with their luggage to Charles de Gaulle. The strike also appears to have ensnared Courtney Love Cobain, who tweeted a photo from inside her car saying it was attacked by protesters on her way from the airport. In subsequent tweets, the musician said protesters took her driver hostage, forcing her to pay someone to take, away, take her away by motorcycle. Today's strike follows a series of altercations between taxi drivers and Uber chauffeurs across France. A 26-year-old man in Lyons said he was attacked Saturday night after telling a taxi driver he would use Uber because the driver was on strike and refused to take him. In Strasbourg last week, taxi drivers reportedly posed as Uber customers and led drivers to isolated locations to assault them. French taxi syndicates also staged a major protest against Uber last year, which quickly turned violent. The head of the French taxi service, G7, said, quote, We are truly sorry to have to hold clients and drivers hostage. We are not doing this lightly. TechCrunch reports, quote, According to the police, 2,800 tax drivers are protesting today against Uber POP, the European equivalent of Uber X. With Uber POP, everyone can become an Uber driver. Taxi drivers see the service as unfair competition, as they have to get a special license. There are other protests happening right now in Nietzsche, Marcel, Tursol, Bordeaux, Lyon, and Lille. It's the biggest protest so far against the urban transportation company in France, as Uber POP has been expanding to new French cities. 
the French government immediately capitulated to the rioting cabbies. Quote, following today's protest, France's interior minister ordered the per Paris police to implement a ban on Uber Pop in the capital. Quote, I have given instructions considering the grave problems with public order and the development of this illegal activity to the police prefecture in Paris to ban Uber Pop activities, Interior Minister Bernard Cazvan told reporters. A sad day for people who need a safe, cheap way to get where they're going. And so the taxi organizations do have a point here. The, the, their means, uh, their mechanisms of trying to combat against Uber is obviously illegitimate. Uh, smashing up cars, attacking drivers, uh, holding people hostage. I mean, this is all very violent, very terrible stuff. But they do have a point in regards to their application for a registration of a license to the government. I mean, this is a very expensive and lengthy process that they have to go through in order to secure their registration with the state uh, so that they are not banned from providing their services. So, you know, libertarians would advocate that um, all of the registrations and licenses should go. Uh, taxi drivers shouldn't need to register any more than um, some ride-sharing organization who is providing their services to their clients directly. Uh, there shouldn't be any restrictions on who can enter into the market and licensure and uh, medallions and all of this stuff certainly limit the competition and limit the ability for new companies to enter into the market. So this is a little bit of an earlier article. Um, it was posted in January of 2015. And it is called The Left's War on Uber Sharing and the Poor. This was posted on uh, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org. And it was posted by Andro Sirios. Uber has jumped on the scene as the quintessential example of the new technology-driven sharing economy. The company allows customers to request rides from mobile app, which will select a nearby Uber driver to taxi you to your desired location. Uber itself has simply exploded and is now worth some $40 billion and made around $2 billion in revenue in 2013. And it's not only a successful business story, it's great for customers. A study from UC Berkeley found that, Compared to the ride-sharing companies, taxis are slow to pick up passengers, if they come at all. No matter the time of day or week, around 90% of ride-sourcing companies' customers were picked up in less than 10 minutes. Those same percentages were dismal when asked of taxi customers. During the week, less than 40% were picked up within 10 minutes. Adding to this, these ride-sourcing companies are also much cheaper than taxis, even with their dreaded surge pricing, which, as Walter Block has shown, is a great way to reduce traffic congestion. So obviously, as with most companies that are hugely successful and offer a great service that customers love, left liberals hate it. First, the self-parody that is Salon told us why Uber must be stopped, because Uber is the embodiment of unrestrained hyper-capitalism and has tried to hire away drivers from its competitors. Salon then asks, quote, quote, The real question, what happens when a company with the DNA of Uber ends up winning it all? The answer is, one, it's highly unlikely, and two, competition would come in and take a piece of it all, which has happened over and over and over and over again, unless, of course, the government makes or protects it. Now comes Leo Mirani at Quartz telling us, quote, the secret to Uber's success is wealth inequality. He starts off well enough. Quote, of the many attractions offered by my hometown, a West Coast peninsula famed for its deep natural harbor, perhaps the most striking is that you never have to leave the house. With nothing more technologically advanced than a phone, you can arrange to have delivered to your doorstep, often in less than an hour, take away food, your weekly groceries, alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, over-the-counter prescription prescribed, books, newspapers, a dozen eggs, half dozen eggs, a single egg. I once had a single bottle of Coke sent to my house at the same price I would have paid had I gone to the shop myself. Various companies are now described now as Uber for massages, Uber for alcohol, and Uber for laundry and dry cleaning, among many, many other things. 
Morani then asserts that it shouldn't be surprising that Uber got started in the aftermath of the financial crisis because, quote, there needs to be a large enough labor class willing to work at wages that customers consider affordable and that middlemen consider worthwhile for their profit margins. He says this as if providing jobs to people who need them is a bad thing. Yes, if everyone was filthy rich and could drive around in gold-plated limos driven by state-of-the-art Johnny Five robots, Uber would be unnecessary to both the people it employs and the customers it serves. So what? The real question is if Uber provides a worthwhile opportunity. One would think so since its employees can quit whenever they want. Furthermore, according to an analysis by John Kuo, the average Uber driver makes $15 per ride. So in order to make $50,000 a year, a driver would need to give 60 rides per week plus another 5 to 10 to pay for the insurance, gas, and maintenance. A much less scientific investigation by Johanna Bruin gave her an average of $21.90 an hour minus the cost of gas and wear and tear. While this is certainly less than what Uber has claimed in the past, it's still not bad either. It must also be noted that the American taxi system, which Uber is displacing, is largely trapped in a cartelized system that prevents entry from newcomers. In New York City, for example, a taxi cab medallion required by all taxi drivers costs $817,000. And that's down 17% from 2013. Talk about keeping the little guy out. As Josh Barrow notes, quote, Most major American cities have long used a system to limit the number of operating taxi cabs. And what is the only reason those prices are going down? You guessed it, competition from car service apps. But isn't Uber just sucking profit off from the decent, hardworking people? Marani again says, Quote, instead, it is a rerun of the oldest sort of business, middlemen insinuating themselves between buyers and sellers. All that modern technology has done is make it easier, through omnipresent smartphones, to amass a fleet of increasingly desperate job seekers, eager to take whatever work they can get. Middlemen don't insinuate themselves between buyers and sellers. Instead, they serve a vital purpose to a well-functioning economy by facilitating transactions. The world is a vast place, and the right buyer and seller can have a hard time finding each other. Middlemen bring them together. What you want is the middlemen to be as streamlined and efficient as possible. So back in the day, we had travel agents. Now, while a few, usually specialized travel agents are still around, we have Expedia and Kayak and other online services. These are much easier, cheaper, and more efficient, i.e., they are better middlemen. And what could be easier and more efficient than the Uber app? Angry taxi drivers have effectively gotten France to ban Uber. And they've done the same elsewhere, too. Some liberals seem to think this is a victory for the little guy. In reality, it's little more than another example of Wood's Law. The sharing economy actually allows the normal person to compete with massive corporations through the conduit of new, more dynamic companies. Take Airbnb. Just like Uber, Airbnb is cheaper than hotels, allowing consumers to save money. But it also allows random Joes and Janes to compete with the Hilton and Motel 6. A friend of mine is starting a new company and trying to live off of as little as possible. He uses Airbnb to rent out his own home whenever he's out of town, or sometimes he'll just sleep at a friend's house or the office. He said he made $10,000 last year from it, and this has helped him save money to grow his entrepreneurial venture. Another way to earn some spare money is Relay Rides, which allows people to rent out their cars. Flight Car offers cheaper car rentals by letting people rent out their car while they're gone on a flight instead of paying for extended stay par parking. Those who offer up their car get free parking, a cut of the rental fee, and a free car wash. Those who rent get a cheaper rental. Prosper allows people to loan each other money, i.e. cutting out the middleman. Kickstarter can get projects of wildly differing sizes and variety funded. Adam Carolla is even funding his new movie that way. Take that, Hollywood. And then there's Elance, which provides a great way for freelancers to find work. And let's not forget Craigslist, which is basically one giant garage sale.
One of the most brilliant new programs for the sharing economy is Patreon. Before, popular artists, entertainers, and educators on the internet had to rely on small ad revenues, gimmicky merchandise, or inconsistent donations. Now, fans of various creators can offer a monthly donation that will automatically be withdrawn from their account, effectively giving these artists a salary. Personally, I'm a big fan of a small video production company called Red Letter Media, which produced the absolutely hilarious takedown of the Star Wars prequels. I have no idea what they were making before, but now they have 1,639 patrons and make about $10,000 a month. In other words, Patreon has allowed a few small timers from Wisconsin to manage a $100,000 a year business, critiquing movies and making movies of their own. This also puts the lie to the idea that without copyright, artists would starve. People will support artists they like, especially when given adequate conduits to do so. Uber and the sharing economy may have their flaws, but overall, the sharing economy is a powerful, liberating force that represents the dynamic nature of a free market and a free society. It has created a series of streamlined, efficient middlemen that allow the average people to compete with giant corporations. It is creative destruction at its finest, and we can embrace it. That article is by Andrew Sirios, and it is called The Left's War on Uber, Sharing, and the Poor, and it was posted on Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. This has been a presentation of the Austrian Circle, and we've been talking about ride-sharing organizations displacing the traditional taxi cab uh, model of transporting people around. And we've also been talking about free societies and free markets and how when you have competition and you have free markets and you have people who can turn down services from other people or can decide whether or not they want to patronize a certain company, you get accountability, you get responsibility, and you get respect between the people who are making those transactions. And on the flip side, of course, when you introduce government laws and mandates and force and licensure and regulations and banning, then you get the opposite. You get uh, more people being rude, uh, coarse, and not very pleasant to each other because they don't really have any options. There's no other choice that they can have to patronize a different organization who might be more willing to provide them with a better service. So thank you again. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great week. Take care.